Last class we were discussing about the various water quality parameters. We have seen in detail what are the physical, chemical and biological parameters of water and we have also discussed what is the importance of each and every parameter and how to analyze those one and what are the instruments used for those for the determination of these parameters. And we have also discussed that the physical parameters like color, order, turbidity, etc. is important for the appearance of water and whereas bacteriological quality is the most important parameter for water quality especially when it comes to drinking water. If the water is not safe bacteriologically then we cannot supply it but coming to chemical parameters for emergency purpose we can even supply the water even if it is not meeting the chemical parameters but for long, long term supply we have to take care of the chemical parameters according to the standards laid by either Bureau of Indian Standards or Environmental Protection Agency or other recognized standards. Today we will discuss about the water treatment systems because if the water quality is not meeting the required standards we have to improve the standards. So how can we improve the standards? So that for that we have to give various treatment treatments to the water systems. And in the first class we have discussed the major objective or one of the major objectives of environmental engineering is to supply adequate quantity of pure water. And we have also discussed what are the various water sources available. We have surface sources, groundwater sources, ponds, lakes, ocean, etc. But depending upon the quality of water, we have to give various types of treatment. Earlier, the water sources, especially the surface water sources were very, very poor, very, very clear. So, there was no need of any treatment. But during industrial revolution, what happened? Many people moved towards the water sources and because of that the water sources started getting contaminated and the quality was far away from the required quality for various beneficial uses. And if we scan through the literature, even in the Sanskrit literature, In BC 2000 itself people were aware of the water treatment. They have mentioned about the boiling of water and subsequent filtration of water before drinking. And even in the old medical books we can see what is the relationship between the clean water and the control of diseases or the contaminated water and incidence of diseases. And earlier days or in olden days, most of the water treatment systems were household basis or for individual houses they were having the water treatment systems. But only the starting of first century, community based treatment systems started coming up. And if you see the history again, we can see that European countries were much advanced in terms of water treatment compared to American countries. But the water treatment systems, whatever we are seeing today almost all are developed in 19th century only. Now we will see what are the different engineered water treatment systems available. So when we talk about the treatment
treatment as I have already mentioned we have to decide the treatment units based upon the source of water and the level of contamination. It is very clear from this picture okay if you talk about the ground water source, ground water source with high hardness okay wh what type of a treatment system we have to provide so you are getting the raw water and first you have to go for aeration and followed by softening here we are adding lime as well as soda and after softening we can go for filtration and after filtration you have to go for disinfection then supply this is the typical treatment system adopted for a groundwater source with high hardness so first what we have to do is we have to take the raw water then aerated the aeration process is for removing undesirable gases present in the water as well as to remove metals like manganese iron etc then if hardness is very high then what we have to do we have to remove the hardness because excess hardness is not permitted so how can we remove the hardness for that we have to go for softening process here what we are doing is we are adding lime and soda so if you add lime and soda the hardness is caused because of divalent cations especially the presence of calcium and magnesium causes the hardness which we have discussed in the last class so how can we remove this hardness so we can precipitate out this calcium and magnesium calcium can be precipitated out as calcium carbonate which is highly insoluble and magnesium can be precipitated out as magnesium hydroxide so by the addition of this lime and soda lime means calcium oxide when it mix with water you will be getting calcium hydroxide and soda ash is Na2CO3 so when we add this lime and soda ash what happens whatever is the calcium and magnesium present in the system it will be getting precipitated as calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide so we can remove the sludge by settling and take the sludge to sludge frying bed and we can even remove the or we can recover the lime if it require and after the softening what we have to do we have to go for filtration here we will be using sand filters so this will be removing whatever is the leftover flocks of calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide and we can even add some chlorine to the filter bed to avoid microbial growth on the filter bed because the filter bed is exposed to the atmosphere so there is a chance of bacterial growth so we can avoid that one by adding chlorine and after this one we can come go for disinfection by the addition of chlorine this is what we are practice, practicing in India instead of chlorine we can go for either ozone or UV radiation and once this treatment is over we can send it to the distribution system but if the groundwater is not having hardness and most of the groundwater depending upon the locality and the mineralogy of that area the concentration of calcium and magnesium will be varying okay so most of the ground waters we can just take it 
and if iron and manganese are not present then we can just go for the disinfection and supply and if the ground water is also contaminated this treatment may not be sufficient we may have to go for other additional treatments. So, what I wanted to say is the treatment processes we can or treatment system we cannot generalize it is all depending upon the type of water available and what is the use what is the purpose of the water we are treating for or making for that is the thing which decides the treatment system. For example, we will see if instead of ground water we are using highly contaminated surface waters then what are the treatments we have to provide. surface water with organic contamination. So, what type of a treatment we can provide for this type of a water? Again your raw water is coming if it is having lot of suspended matter and settleable solids we have to go for plain sedimentation, plain sedimentation followed by coagulation and flocculation then filtration adsorption disinfection then supply this is the continuation of this one okay so here what is happening is and here if we can add if you okay here the raw water is coming and the settle, if it is having lot of settleable solids then we can go for a sedimentation plain sedimentation tank here because of gravity the settleable solids will be settling down and we can add chlorine or other chemicals for oxidizing the organic matter present or preventing any biological action sometimes we can add even ammonia to prevent the biological actions once the plain sedimentation is over okay here we will be getting settleable sludge in the plain sedimentation tank this we can take to sand beds for drying and after the plain sedimentation what we have to do here all the settleable solids are removed and it will be left over with colloidal particles as well as dissolved solids. So, if you want to remove the colloidal solids we have to go for coagulation and flocculation. Here we have to add coagulants that means alum and <laughs> other polymers. So, by the addition of these chemicals alum, lime and other polymers. So, by the addition of this one the particles the colloidal particles will get destabilized and we can settle them easily and after this coagulation flocculation we will be having a secondary sedimentation tank where all the flocks will be separated. After this coagulation flocculation we have to go for filtration either slow sun filter or rapid sun filter and here we can add even chlorine to prevent the 
biological growth. And after filtration, we have to go for adsorption. Here, we use either activated carbon or other suitable adsorbents to remove the organic content present in the water. Once adsorption is over, the water is almost free from the solids, both dissolved as well as dissolved colloidal as well as suspended solids. Then we have to go for disinfection to make sure the water is bacteriologically safe. And during dis disinfection, we will be providing enough chlorine to take care of all the contaminants present in the water as well as some leftover chlorine which is known as residual chlorine to take care of whatever is the contamination, the minimum contamination what is going to happen in the distribution system and once the disinfection is over, we can put the water into the distribution system for the supply. So, depending upon the water source, we have to decide which, which all the treatments we have to provide. So, now we will see each, each of this process in detail, how to design the unit processes. First one is aeration. The purpose of aeration is to remove objectionable gases present in the water as well as objectionable, mater objectionable materials present in the water in presence of oxygen to handleable materials. For example, the objectionable gases present in the water are mainly hydrogen sulphide and carbon dioxide. So, gases like H2S and carbon dioxide can be removed from the water by aeration and objectionable materials like iron and manganese can be removed by aeration. So, how these gases are coming into the water? Okay, if it is rain water, the amount of hydrogen sulphide, hydrogen sulphide and carbon dioxide getting dissolved in water will be very, very negligible. So, we do not have to remove them, but if it is ground water, especially when the water is under high pressure, the solubility of these gases will be very, very high. So, if these gases are present in the water, it will be producing undesirable smell. smell. So, we cannot supply that water. So, before supplying, we have to remove the undesirable, undesirable smell and odor of the water. So, how can we remove the smell and odd, smell or odor? What we have to do is, we have to oversaturate the water with oxygen. So, because of the oversaturation with oxygen, what will happen? This dissolved gases will be getting expelled from the water. So, that is what is happening in aeration. So, you have a water which is having hydrogen sulphide or carbon dioxide dissolved in, in it. So, what we do is, we have providing excess oxygen to that water. So, what will happen? The water will become oversaturated with oxygen. So, in that process, these gases will be coming out. So, once these gases are out, then the order of the water will be getting removed. So, similarly, the metals like iron and manganese. So, how can we remove these, these metals? In the ground water, the availability of oxygen is limited. So, these metals will be in their reduced form. For example, if you take iron, Fe, Fe will be in the form of Fe2 plus and Mn, Mn also in the form of Mn2 plus. So, if you can provide excess oxygen, then this Fe2 plus can get oxidized to Fe3 plus and Mn2 plus can get oxidized to Mn4 plus. So, once it is getting oxidized to Fe3 plus and Mn4 plus, then we can easily remove them by precipitation. The chemical reaction we can write like this for Fe2 plus plus O2 plus 10 H2O gives you for Fe OH plus 8 H plus 
similarly for manganese we can write like this 2 m n 2 plus plus O 2 plus water gives m n O 2 plus 4 H plus. So, here Fe 2 plus is getting converted to Fe 3 plus and this Fe 3 plus is ferric hydroxide is precipitating out. Similarly, M n 2 plus is getting oxidized to M n 4 plus and it is precipitating out. So, for example, if you take the ground water which is rich in iron and if we expose that one to the atmosphere, you can see a brown color or a reddish color in the water. What is that? It is this reaction only. Okay, This reaction is taking place in the water. When you take the ground water, it is having low oxygen content, but when it is exposed to the atmosphere, what will happen? It is coming in contact with oxygen. So, Fe 2 plus is getting oxidized to Fe 3 plus and this Fe 3 plus will be precipitating out as Fe ferric hydroxide. That a ferric hydroxide flocks you are seeing as the reddish material in water. Similarly, manganese oxide also can be removed, but manganese oxide precipitation is a very slow process at low pH, means the pH less than 9, the manganese oxide precipitation is low. So, if you want to increase the reaction rate, what you have to do? You have to increase the pH of the system. So, this is this is what is happening in aeration and in some cases for the removal of vivosis that means volatile organic compounds like phenols, benzene, toluene, xylene etc. Also this aeration is being used but their removal is not we cannot remove them completely using aeration, but if the concentration is very, very high, then we can use go for aeration and bring the concentration down to the handleable level and further we can go for other treatments like adsorption or ion exchange, etc. Mainly adsorption because this organic compounds can be removed easily by adsorption process. So, in short, we can tell that aeration is used for the removal of objectionable gases like hydrogen sulphate, carbon dioxide, etc. from the water and objectionable materials like Fe, M and etc. to handleable materials. Then in sometimes we can use aeration for the removal of volatile organic compounds like phenols, benzenes, toluene, etc. But in the case of VOCs, we cannot remove them completely. We can reduce the high concentration to a certain level and afterwards we have to go for further treatment. Now we discuss how can we achieve this aeration, what are the different ways we can provide aeration to the water. I am going to discuss aeration in water treatment systems. So what are the various process for aeration? Aeration can be done either dispersing air into water or dispersing water into air. Okay, both the ways we can carry out this aeration. In the first one, we are dispersing air into water. So, what will happen? Okay, we are injecting high pressure air to the water which, which has to be aerated. So, it is something like this. You have the air bubble. This is your air bubble. Okay, this we can call it as air film, and this is the liquid film. 
and this is the bulk liquid. Okay, you are dispersing the air into the liquid. So, air bubble is there in the bulk liquid and this air bubble will be having a air film surrounded to that one and after that air film you will be having a liquid film and this is the bulk liquid. So, if you assume C T is the concentration of the pollutant in the bulk liquid and C S is the concentration of the pollutant in the air bubble. So, if C S is if if C S is less than C T then what will happen? C S is less than C T that means here the concentration is less compared to the bulk liquid. So, naturally the concentration gradient will be from the bulk liquid to the air bubble. So, the pollutant will be moving towards this side the pollutant will be moving towards this side this is known as desorption. Okay. If the case is the other way if C S is greater than C T that means if the dissolved oxygen concentration of the bulk liquid is less than the oxygen concentration of this air bubble then what will happen the concentration gradient will be in the opposite direction it will be like this that means the oxygen will be getting transferred from the air bubble to the bulk liquid. So, that we can call it as adsorption or the bulk liquid is adsorbing the gas from the air bubble. So, this is an ex example of dispersing air into water. So, we can see the other case dispersing water into air it will be also the same. So, here we, we will be having the liquid liquid at the center and this will be the liquid film and you will be having the this is the here in center is liquid. So, this is liquid film and this is the gas film. and this is bulk gas and your concentration here in the liquid is C T and the bulk gas it is C S the saturation concentration. So, this is the example of dispersing water into air that is why the liquid bubble is inside. So, if C T is greater than C S what will happen okay that means the concentration of the liquid film concentration of the pollutant in the liquid is more than the concentration of the pollutant in the gas phase. So, naturally the pollutant will be moving moving from the liquid to the gas. So, this is this is the case of desorption and similarly if C T is less than C S that means here the concentration is less compared to the bulk gas. So, naturally the gas will be moving towards the liquid. So, that is an example of adsorption. So, this is the principle of aeration. So, in, in case of water treatment systems the aeration most of the time what we do is dispersing water into air this is what we usually go for. So, we will see what are the different systems adopted for the dispersion of water into air. aerators the most commonly used ones are fountains second one is cascade aerators and third one is tray aerators okay now we will see how this fountains or cascade aerators or spray spray aerators are made. In fountains it is nothing but a grid of pipelines
provided above a basin. So, what is happening? This grid of pipelines will be having nozzles at different various locations and nozzles are provided in such a way that the air will be flowing, air will be coming out under high pressure in the upward direction. So, you will be providing supplying water, this water, is, water will be under high pressure and it will be coming and the nozzles are provided at different locations, different locations and the water will be coming out in the upward direction with high velocity. The no, nozzle size varies from 2 to 4 centimeters and the pressure usually maintained is around 70 kilo pascals. So, high pressure it will be coming and 2 to 4 centimeter diameter nozzles are provided. So, what will happen? This nozzles will be injecting the water in the upward direction and it will be having very high kinetic energy. Once the kinetic energy is lost, what will happen? The water will be falling down and it will be collected in the bottom basin. So, during that time it is coming in contact with the atmosphere and naturally the contact area is so high, so lot of gas transfer will be taking place. During that time the whatever is the odorous gases present in the water will be escaping. The si similarly, the met metals like Fe or Mn whatever is in the reduced form will be getting oxidized and subsequently it can be removed. So, this is the cascade system and the area required for this one is in the order of 10 meter square per liti 50 liters per second. So, we can design this system very easily and the spacing between the pipes, pipings vary from 60 to 60 centimeters to 350 centimeters depending upon the crowding because when you have the nozzle how high it is coming up and how much crowding is taking place depending upon that one you can decide the spacing ok. This is the spacing and this is the area required and this is the pressure required and this is the size of the nozzle. So, based upon this one you can design your cask fountains. Now, we will see what is this cascade aerators. Cascade aerators are just like steps, like this. So, what happens? The water is lift to the top of this cascade and allowed to pass through this one. So, water will be falling like this. and it is being collected here at the bottom. So, most of the time the height of this step is around 30 centimeter and most of the cases the cascade aerators will be having 10 number of steps. So, we can easily find out what is the head loss here. The head loss is nothing but the total height from here to here where the collection system is. So, what will happen? The water thin film of water is passing through this step. So, the area of contact is increased considerably. So, what will happen? The oxygen transfer will be or the gas transfer will be very, very fast because the contact area is very high. So, the odorless gases will be escaping from the system as well as more oxygen is available. So, the material whichever is in the reduced form will be getting oxidized. So, this is cascade aerators. And here the area requirement is in the order of 4 to 9 meter square per 50 liters per second. So, this is the area requirement almost same as that of fountains. Now, we will see what is this tray aerators. Tray aerators are something similar to the cascade aerators. Only difference is the water is allowed to pass through some solid media. Water is allowed to pass through the solid media and the reactions will be taking place on the solid surface so that more contact will be there 
and the reactions will be much faster. So that is what is happening in triaerators. So now we have discussed how to, what is the purpose of an aerator and what are the different types of aerators available and how can we increase the rate of gas transfer. So these are the most commonly used aerators in water treatment and we can even go for the dispersion of gas in the liquid. If you are going for the dispersion of gas in the liquid, what we have to do? We have to make some tanks and water will be flowing through that tank and the depth of the tank will be varying from 2.5 to 5 meters and you can provide aeration using nozzles. nozzles or surface aerators etc etc this type of system is commonly used in wastewater treatment wastewater treatment where the oxygen requirement is very very high okay in water treatment we usually go for this fountains cascade aerators and tray aerators removal of solids for this one we are using sedimentation sedimentation or clarification sedimentation or clarification this is the unit operation we usually use for the removal of solids this solids mainly settleable or suspended suspended solids and colloidal solids So what is happening in sedimentation? Because of the gravity force and because of the weight of the particle, the particle will be settling, settling down. So what we have to do is allow the water to stay cushioned in some settling basin or sedimentation basin and give enough detention time so that the particle will be settling down and we can collect the clear water from the outlet and this settling is depending upon the liquid characteristics as well as the particle characteristics. So particles can be divided into basically two categories. One is discrete, discrete particles, discrete, discrete particles and another one is flocculent. flocculent particles discrete particles are the one which particles are the one which do not change its size shape and specific gravity or the properties with respect to time Th those are known as discrete particles that means the particle will be settling as independent particles it will not be affected by the surrounding particles but in in the case of flocculent particles what is happening is with respect to time the size, shape and the specific gravity of the particles may be changing. So naturally the settling velocity will not be a constant. So in case of discrete particle we can find out the settling velocity using classical mechanics. But in this flocculent particle settling we cannot do that one because the particles keep on changing its size, shape and specific gravity. So naturally with respect to time the particle size may be increasing shape may be varying and specific gravity will be varying. So what <coughs> it is very very difficult to find out what is the settling velocity. So we have to find out the settling velocity by conducting experiments. So for example the flocculent particles if you take 2 3 particles like this. So what will happen with respect to time these particles will be agglomerating like this initially 2 particles and with respect to time 2 or 3 particles will be agglomerating. So what will happen? The particle size is increasing with respect to time. So naturally the settling velocity will be increasing and the specific gravity will be varying. Why the specific gravity is varying? Because here only one particle was there, here two particles, here three particles. So the entire one will be acting as a single particle 
So, some water will be getting entrapped in this particles in between the particle. So, naturally the bulk specific gravity of this particle will be varying. And again when we coming when we discuss about the sedimentation we have to talk about dilute dilute suspensions and concentrate concentrated suspensions in dilute suspensions the concentrations of particles are so low so there is no in the in the particle attraction or one particle is not affected by the other particle or each particle will be settling as independent particle so so this concentration of the suspension is also important when we discuss about the sedimentation or clarification in concentrated suspension what will happen the concentration of the particles are so high so intra particle forces will be present there so each particle settling will be affected by other particles so each particle will not be settling as independent particle so they will be settling as a group of particles that is what is happening in concentrated suspension so based upon the nature of the suspension as well as the nature of the particles we can classify the settling into four categories so those are one is type 1 settling and second one is type 2 settling third one is type 3 settling or zone settling and fourth one is compression settling so we can represent this one pictorially it is something like this okay here we are representing discrete particles discrete particles and here flocculent particles okay and this axis represent the concentration here zero percentage concentration and here 100 percentage concentration so y axis represent the concentration and x axis represent the nature of the particle that means discrete particle to flocculent particle so we can divide it into different categories so you will be getting something like this so this is type 1 settling and this is type 2 settling and this portion is type 3 settling or sound settling and this is compression settling so type 1 settling means you have dilute suspension and discrete particle whenever there is a dilute suspension and discrete particle you will be having type 1 settling and whenever there is a flocculent particle and dilute suspension that is type 2 so type 1 and type 2 are for dilute suspensions but one is type 1 is for discrete particles whereas type 2 is for flocculent particles but if the flocculent particle concentration is high means relatively high then you will be getting sound settling and if the concentration of discrete particles or flocculent particles if they are high then you will be getting compression settling for example of type 1 settling if you have colloidal part particle or sand or silt particle if you see the settling of silt particle in the primary sedimentation time or after a heavy rain 
whatever water is coming to a river, if you put it in a sedimentation tank and if you watch the settling, that is the example of type 1 settling because the silt particle, they are discrete particle because they will not be agglomerating together, so they will be settling as independent particles. So that is an example of type 1 settling and type 2 settling that means dilute suspension of flocculent particles. So for example, if you take the coagulation flocculation process, so what we are doing is we are adding alum as the chemical for the destabilization of colloidal particles. So what will happen, this alum will be reacting with water to form aluminum hydroxide. So you will be getting aluminum hydroxide flux and the concentration of the flux will be less. So that will be settling as flocculent settling. So that is the example for type 2 settling and for sawn settling usually this is not coming in water treatment, this is usually occurring in wastewater treatment systems. Ex for example, activated sludge process. So what is happening, you will be having an aerated tank, aeration tank where your wastewater is coming which is containing lot of microorganism and as we know the wastewater will be having lot of organic material. So if you provide enough oxygen, what will happen? The microorganism will be utilizing the organic matter as their food and they will be oxidizing it to carbon dioxide and water and a part of the organic matter will be getting converted to microorganisms. So if you leave that microorganisms as such, your BOD or COD will not be meeting the effluent discharge standards. So what we have to do? We have to remove the bacterial cells from the whatever is coming from the aerated tank. So what we do, we provide a sedimentation tank. So the secondary sedimentation tank, so that sedimentation tank is known as secondary sedimentation tank. So in the settling that is occurring in the secondary sedimentation tank of an activated sludge process is the example of salt settling. So here what is happening, the settling of each particle is affected by the other particle. So during that settling what will happen, each particle will be having a fixed position because of the repulsive forces. So end a particle will be moving as a group of par particle or it will be the settling will be occurring as a sound. You can see a clear sound something like this. With respect to time what will happen, the clear sound will be moving down and the suspended particles will be getting concentrated in this portion or we can tell that the settling is just like or the suspended particles will be moving just like a blanket. That means each particle will be having a fixed position in that entire system. So one cannot move independently, so everything will be moving as a whole. So this is known as sawn settling. Now coming to the compression settling. Here the concentration of either the discrete particles or the flocculent particles are very very high. So what will happen? One particle will be lying above the other particle. So because of the weight of the particle, it will be settling down and the water, whatever is present in the system will be getting expelled and it will be reaching a stage. After that there will not be any settling possible or any consolidation possible. So this is known as compression settling. This compression settling happens wherever we go for sludge thickening. Sludge thickening. So but most of the cases as I told earlier the sound settling and compression settling is coming when we deal with waste water. So I will be concentrating on the type 1 and type 2 settling and how to design this type of sedimentation tanks. So in type 1 settling, type 1 settling when the particle is in the liquid, this is your sedimentation tank, it is filled with water and your particle is here. So as I told earlier, type 1 settling can be 
represented by classic mechanics. So, if you take a particle like this, what are the forces acting on that particle? The particle will be having a particular weight. So, the weight force will be acting on the particle. So, this will be acting in this direction. This will be f of t. That means, because of the gravity, the weight, weight of the particle is acting in the downward direction and another force acting on this is the buoyant force. Buoyant force will be acting in the opposite direction. So, the impelling force that means the impelling force for the movement of this particle is this weight force and the resultant of the weight force and the buoyant force or the impelling force is nothing but F g minus F b. So, another force acting on the body is the track force F d. So, the three forces different forces acting on the body are the force due to weight force, buoyant force and track force. So, by considering these three forces we can find out what is the settling velocity of the particle. What will happen to the particle if it is in the system? So, initially because of this weight force and the buoyant force or the resulting force, the body will be moving at a faster rate. But what will happen? The rate will be retarded because of the track force, this F d acting on the body. So, the acceleration will be coming down or the velocity of the particle will be the rate of change of velocity will be coming down and afterwards the particle will be moving at a constant velocity or the acceleration will become 0. At that time what will happen? This F g minus F b will be equal to the track force. By using this equation we can find out what is the settling velocity of this particle and once you know the settling velocity we can design the sedimentation tank. These things we will discuss in the next class. So, now we will see what all are the things we have seen in the present class. So, we were discussing that okay, we have to meet the water quality criteria or standards for each and every beneficial use, but depending on, upon the source of water, the quality of water will be different. So, how can we improve the water quality? Okay, we have to go for various treatments. So, depending upon the source of water, and the quality of water available, we have to decide which are the which are the treatment systems we have to adopt. And these treatment systems are not a constant or the or a fixed one. Okay. So, what is the beneficial use and what is the characteristics of the source water? Okay, we have to decide that one. And we have seen okay what are the treatment units we have to provide if it is a groundwater source with high hardness and we have also discussed what are the treatment units we have to provide if it is surface water containing lot of organic matter. Now and again we have discussed how to design an aerator and what is the purpose of an aeration unit. Okay? Aeration units are usually provided for the removal of order forming gases like hydrogen sulphide, carbon dioxide etcetera and for the removal of undesirable materials like manganese iron to the desired form. That means, iron in the Fe2 form we cannot remove it, but if you can oxidize it to Fe3 form, it will be precipitating out easily as ferric hydroxide. Similarly, manganese can be removed by oxidizing it to manganese oxide MnO2. And some volatile organic compounds, if the concentration is very high, for example, phenol, benzene, toluene, etcetera, if the concentration of the volatile organic compounds present is very, very high, then we can remove them to a certain extent by aeration. But complete removal is very difficult. So, if you want to remove them completely, we have to go for some sub subsequent treatments. And we have also discussed about what are the different aerators, for example, fountains cascade aerators and tray aerators and sometimes we can even go for nozzles and diffusers and etcetera. It, it depends upon whether you want to 
disperse air on water or water on air. And we were discussing about what are the different types of sedimentation, what are the different types of settling. We can classify them depending upon the type of the particles and the type of the suspension. If it is dilute suspension with discrete particle, we call it as type 1 settling and dilute suspension with flocculent particle, we can call it as flocculent settling or type 2 settling. If the concentration of the particle is relatively high, then we get sawn settling and if the concentration is very high, then we can go for, then the settling is classified as compression settling. And in type 1 settling, we can find out the settling velocity by a classical mechanics. We can take the force balance on the particle and we can find out the settling. So, we will be discussing this in detail in the coming class. Thank you.